Can I request everyone to please take their seats? We're going to start with a special lecture. There's a slight change in this lecture. Shri Prakash Javedkar could not join us. So we've requested Professor Nitya Rao, and she's kindly agreed. The topic of this lecture, a crisis of reproduction, land, migration, and gender in contemporary Jharkhand. This lecture will be chaired by Alpa Shah, Associate Professor, London School of Economics and Political Science, and delivered by Nitya Rao, Professor, University of East Anglia, Norwich. Can I please request the chair to take over the proceedings? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to be chairing this session for two reasons. Uh, um, I think that uh, it's really important that this, this presentation has been made into a Silver Jubilee lecture. It's on one of the most important issues that is facing Jharkhand, Jharkhand Bihar today. Uh, um, Professor Rao has very um, thoughtfully mod moderated her presentation to address uh, the changes uh, in tenancy laws that are taking place in Jharkhand at this moment. Tenancy law changes in the Shodhanakpur Tenancy Acts and the Santal Pargana Acts, uh, which dramatically uh, change uh, the situation uh, uh, affecting uh, Adivasis people living in, in, in Jharkhand today. And uh, it's, it's, it's terribly important for this uh, conference to be addressing this issue. So I'm really, really happy to introduce Professor Nitya Rao to you. Uh, Professor Rao wrote one of the most important books on land and tenancy laws and gender uh, based on studies of two villages in the Santal Parganas. This book was called Good Women Do Not Inherit Land, The Politics of Land and Gender in India. It was published in 2008. She has also published extensively on education, on migration, on marriage, um, uh, and from a comparative perspective. So, um, yeah, uh, over to Professor Rao, uh, who is a Professor of Gender and Development at the University of East Anglia, Norwich. Thank you, Alba, for that uh, introduction. Can you hear me? I would first of all also like to thank Dr. Shaibal Gupta and others at Adri for inviting me uh, to this conference. And while I have not met uh, Arvind Das personally, but his first book or his early book, Changiel, really influenced my way of thinking about villages and thinking about rural life in Bihar. Jharkhand was then a part of Bihar. And to understand social relations uh, in rural contexts without romanticizing them, with empathy but without romanticizing them. Uh, the paper that I'm planning, uh, I present today is uh, based really on 20 years or little more than 20 years of association with the Santhal Parganas, in particular Dumka district, which is now in uh, Jharkhand. Uh, over this period, not just has Jharkhand been created as a separate state, but has made great strides in improvements in literacy rates, basic infrastructure, and so on. I must say that actually my own positionality has also changed over these last 20 years, because I did get involved with work there as an activist rather than an academic, and have moved now to being a full-time academic and researcher. I start uh, with four small anecdotes uh, to reflect my own journey and association with Jharkhand roughly at the intervals of five years each starting in 1994, uh, which I hope will help sort of frame the talk in terms of the key social changes and themes that have emerged over the last 20 years. Uh, my first encounter with Santhal women was through a women's empowerment project run by a Patna-based feminist organization called Aditi. This was in 1994. They had organized a training program in uh, Dumka district, Jarmundi block. Vijay Srinivasan, the founder of Aditi, and I got there. We found that the trainer from Patna had failed to turn up. The place was seen as really too remote, backward, and unsafe for an educated woman from Bihar. We ran the training ourselves, but the inequality and sense of difference even amongst women at that time of the same state was apparent. 
clearly ethnicity mattered even at that time. And similar stereotypes of Santhal women I was confronted with over the following five years in terms of simplicity, that they are uh, subject to all sorts of crimes, including witch hunting, worked very hard, were sexually exploited, were per portrayed as voiceless victims. This idea of Santhal women as not having agency was actually used to raise uh, donor funding for empowerment projects for them. Uh, this kind of representation actually gave strength to the idea of internal colonialism, which was uh, noted at that time and before from the 80s and the 90s by several academics, but also by Adivasi scholars like Dr. Ramdeyal Munda and others. Uh, who were active with the Charkhand movement. I was quite surprised with this framing of empowerment because in my personal interactions with them, I found them quite articulate and strong. Uh, I think one of the problems was an issue of a language which was raised by Nirmal Sengupta in the very first uh, uh, lecture in this uh, conference that till 2001, according to the census, more than 80% of Santhals, particularly Santhal women, were monolingual in Santhali. So it was not always easy to communicate with them, even though they were quite articulate when given the chance. The second uh, moment of my engagement, which was much more longer term, which was part of my PhD research, was between 1998 to 2000, when I stayed in two villages over an extended period of time. I was really curious to explore the questions of voicelessness, of voice, of stereotypes, but very centrally with, uh, with that of issues of land and property. That did the law support the claims of these women, or in the absence of state support, did they compromise in order to secure their livelihoods? What was driving the resistance to women's land claims? Why were men reluctant to grant these, despite notions of relative gender equality? You know, this is again a stereotype of relative gender equality amongst tribal communities in India. It really took me to the larger political economy context in which Adivasi or tribal Santhal identity was being constructed at that time, which was the eve of the formation of Jharkhand as a separate state. During my next phase of fieldwork in 2005-06, I was one day, when going to the village, accosted by a policeman, the head of the local thana. He was visiting the village where I was staying to talk uh, to the Parvanayat, or the leader of a group of villages, about the tense situation in the area. There were press reports on the growing activities of nationalite groups, and he said that these are led by civil elements from outside. I soon realized that he was talking about the neighboring panchayat of Pachwara and Pakur district, which had witnessed strong resistance to a large coal mining project uh, over the previous years. I was told, however, that compensation had been paid and the resistance broken. Work was on full swing on the project, and it was now only a few people who were creating problems. And these were the Naxalites, and they needed to be arrested and put behind bars. In fact, one of the leaders of the protest, Sister Valsa, was killed the following year. He kind of picked me up in his jeep, or sensibly giving me a lift to the village, but was clearly checking me out. This brief encounter raised a number of issues. How had the new state actually managed to acquire land and get an agreement on cash compensation from the local people? Was any dialogue ever held? Was the solution not in contradiction to the existing protective land policies? And the one that I studied was the Santhal Pagana Tenancy Act of 1949. And also, was it not a gross violation of the Supreme Court's Sam Samata Judgment of 1997 in Andhra Pradesh? On August 2, 2000, the Central Parliament had approved the bill for the reorganization of Jharkhand as a separate state. The Bharti Jan BJP formed the uh, uh, a first government in November 2000 rather than the Jharkhand specific parties which had fought for statehood. The Vision 2010 document at that time outlined some of the policy directions and emphases of the new state. And a preliminary reading revealed very clearly a focus on commercialization, export orientation and market development, both in agriculture and industrial sectors. It didn't mince any words uh, with, the, with that. Food security issues, inequalities in resource distribution, destitution did not appear on the agenda of priorities at all. In fact, one of the first steps taken by the government in 2000 was to set up an all-party committee to review the existing land legislation and suggest amendments as needed as the non-transferability of land, which was section 20 of the Santhal Patana Tenancy Act, was seen as the biggest obstacle to economic growth and development. A Santhal headman in one of the villages I visited 
said about the chief minister at that time that he has the body of an Adivasi, but the head and mind of a Marwadi, which is a trading group from North India. He does not care about our land, but is trying to give it to big industries. His policies are targeted to suppress the Adivasis. Buses have been given to cooperatives of tribal youth, but their certificates have been retained, so they cannot apply for any other job till such time as they repay the loan. Schools have been built, but new teachers have not been appointed, and the existing teachers are overloaded with all sorts of work. On top of that, liquor sales have now been legalized, so drinking has greatly increased. The policy seems to be to keep Adivasis drunk and, ed uh, and uneducated. Close quote. Uh, the priorities of the state and the Adivasis clearly started to diverge at that time to the, to the uh, tribal groups, to the Santhals. Land remained with much more than a productive resource, a key element of their social and cultural identity, giving them public visibility, bargaining power, and enhanced statement uh, status. In fact, Jal Jangal Jameen uh, was the foundation of their struggle for a separate state. For the state, however, land now became a commodity to be used in the interests of economic growth through private sector investments. In such a context uh, of uncertainty, actually women's rights, which I had been studying five years earlier, kind of were no longer a priority or had already lost uh, importance. Uh, the final moment was two years ago when I visited Adumka. Uh, and my feelings were really mixed. I had worked in two different villages. On the one hand, in the Plains village, the Santhal teacher with whom I had stayed was the Sarpanch of the village. She was uh, trying to implement development programs, claim rights where possible, and so on. But in the other village, the experience was rather depressing. The road had broken down, school buildings existed, but there was hardly a handful of children present. The health center was locked up. The area was officially under Naxalite control. Uh, in fact, it was uh, very sad, I felt very uh, sad because some of the little boys who had stayed with me, now in their 20s, were missing from the village and rumours had it that they were in jail. With some education, uh, they were challenging the nature of opportunities available to them and uh, clearly uh, put behind bars uh, for this. Some of them who were still there asked me that why the only employment opportunity for them should be manual work provided under the Nariga, Mahatma Gandhi Nariga scheme. Why could they also not skilled work to go along with their educational qualifications? Older men, like the village leader with whom I had stayed, had now started to migrate to Delhi to work in factories, a sign of sheer desperation for survival. The Jharkhand government, uh, very recently, led by non Adivasi for the first time, has in November last year attempted or amended the uh, Santhal Padana Tenancy Act and also the Chota Nagpur Tenancy Act, as Alpa just mentioned. There was no discussion of this in the legislature. So, agricultural land can now be used for non agricultural purposes and acquired by the state for a host of development reasons. There's clearly an emphasis which has sharpened and intensified on a cosmopolitan, modernist growth model, a move very much away from tribal identity, which is still seen as backward. I think drawing on John's discussion uh, last evening, I think Polanyi's uh, idea of the great transformation that the modern market economy, uh, which seeks to commodify land and labor, and the modern nation state should be understood not as discrete elements, but as a single human intervention, which Polanyi calls uh, the market society. An attempt clearly is being made to transform the way people think, their mentalities, their economic rationalities, from one of reciprocity and redistribution to utility maximization and growth. While clearly there's a decline in poverty and hunger from the time of my first and second encounters when children were starving, uh, nutrition levels were very... Uh, uh, very bad. Resistance uh, uh, has continued. Uh, resistance has continued because other forms of inequalities have sharpened, particularly based on ethnicity. Uh, frustrations are uh, growing. You have uh, both political and non-political Adivasi organizations. In literature as well, we find a younger generation of uh, Santhal writers who have been uh, writing stories about Adivasi Santhal oppression. Uh, an expansion of educational provisioning, which I mentioned, may not have led to great gains in skills due to its poor quality. But nevertheless, aspirations are high, awareness is high, and these are largely unmet. 
When domination is perpetrated without facades of caring, of equality, then the dominated, there are few choices. Either they die of neglect, of starvation, they migrate out of distress, or they rise in revolt, thus destroying the very objective of the exploiter. Uh, and this is very visible in Jharkhand today. Such facades are trying, are being recreated, at least discursively, taking the form of expressions of benevolence at the national level. I think we have heard a little bit about Modi's discourse uh, on poverty reduction, attack on the rich and the corrupt, ruthlessness of the naturalites, and uh, so on. It is true that naturalite resistance in some of the Dumka villages, like the village uh, where I stayed, does not seem to have a clear goal or ideology. And I think this sort of reminds me of uh, Wendy Singer's point on the first day, that when there were the debates about the uh, reform of the law in the 1950s, there was a very clear articulation of ideology, which seems to be lacking uh, at this moment. A second conceptual element, I think for me, is the changing relations between land and labor. Are the Santhals being converted from cultivators to laborers? While most Santhals do own land, it is not that they were isolated from the labor markets. Most migrated seasonally to work in agriculture and so on. I think Claude uh, Melassou's work uh, has been very helpful in, theori in theorizing the relationship between persistent low wages and migration patterns of rural labor. Uh, that the implication of permanent migration for capitalism would be the need to pay for both the immediate labor time of the worker and the costs of biological and social reproduction of the labor force. So circular migrants can then be exploited by drawing their labor during the long duration when they have no work at home in a context of monocropping, rain-fed agriculture. And they have that, however, as a backup of their domestic production to meet the daily costs of family reproduction. Such rotating migration, according to Melasu, helps establish a double labor market where the labor is divided between self-production at home and production for the employer, while also supporting a discriminatory ideology based on notions of skills, ethnicity, and poverty. So what will the failure of state policy to protect the land rights, in fact, actively working against it, uh, in, uh, as seen in the recent amendment to the SPTA, convert them, to use Jan Bremen's word, for, into footloose uh, labor? And if so, what are the implications of this? So I quickly will go through sort of the relations of land and labor before examining changing aspirations, identities, and the implications of, for equality and rights as citizens. So uh, globally, of course, land has been central to the identities of indigenous peoples. It has uh, many of their struggles for recognition begin, begin with land. More than a material resource, it becomes a metaphor for their culture, language, social and community norms, and indeed their identity. And I think this has been very central in terms of women's struggles for land as well, to be recognized not just as women or as reproducers, but really as citizens, as cultivators, as producers uh, as well. Um, this, uh, I think this, uh, uh, and this is kind of reflected in many of the Santhal terms, the coexistence of multiple identities and the need to recognize them uh, by women as well, in terms of orahor, homemakers, chasahor, cultivators. So there's whole sets of terms which are used to reflect on these multiple identities and the need to assert them in order to claim rights as citizens. This, of course, has... Uh, found support, this kind of assertion by women particularly of their identities, found support in the 2000s, in the early 2000s, in the national uh, policy agenda on equal property rights, which originally was for gender equality, but later it got translated into a more instrumental debate around food security uh, and enha enhanced food production in the context of male migration from rural areas. This uh, policy in terms of giving preference to women in terms of uh, land rights, however, remained weak in terms of practice due to kind of underlying assumptions that women will just take over roles which men no longer uh, want to do, which was something that women have been rejecting. In fact, in Jharkhand or in Santhal Padganas today, women have been demanding very much reciprocity in the context of declining male roles in joint production and the domestic economy. And it is some of these tensions which I uh, spoke about in my book, uh, 
really looking at how struggles over land are not just about material change or redistribution of a resource. It was not just a productive resource, but it's also about shifts in power relations between different groups, about gaining recognition for one's contributions. It's really about asserting rights as equal citizens. Despite this, the state's support and recognition for women's contributions to agriculture, even from this very instrumental perspective, has been largely absent. I think one of the uh, old issues uh, is, has been around credit and the loss of land. Historically, there has been uh, records of exploitation, displacement across India, including from this region of the Santhal uh, Parganas. This led to various kinds of resistance movements from the Santhal Hull of 1855 to much more recent uh, movements. After independence, of course, the scheduled areas uh, were established post-independence, but displacement has uh, continued land alienation by landlords and moneylenders, deforestation, but also large-scale uh, government development projects. And new forms of debt bondage have actually uh, emerged. The existence of the uh, Santhar Pargana uh, Tenancy Act and its trans uh, non-transferability clause actually pose some form of protection or some form of restriction to the transfer of land. Recently, there has been a host of development purposes. One example is the stone quarries, where no formal land, this is uh, from the mid-2000s, no formal land could be made at that time, though there was some sort of private agreement or contract which the owner of the land, usually an impoverished uh, santhal, made to the contractor, who was usually a diku or somebody from outside. Very few santhals actually turned into contractors. They have raised, the stone quarries have raised a, a range of issues around wages, health hazards, common property, social character of the population itself. Some of the villages, uh, uh, very low wages are being paid uh, and migrant labor brought in from outside. Some of the villages have started organizing the workers to demand minimum wages, but again, there have been ways of cutting down or restricting this kind of unionization or freedom of uh, association. Uh, even just by competition, labor competition, that there's a large pool of labor waiting to take these jobs. I think silicosis, health problems have been other issues uh, that have been noticed in these kinds of working uh, conditions. But one of the issues that has emerged has been that the, while the quarry itself, that land has become clearly unusable for cultivation anymore, but the mud that is taken out has been put on neighboring land, which is often common property, gotcher, or common grazing land. And several of the youth said that it's not just the quarry, but other land has also become unusable. Complaints have been filed, petitions uh, filed more recently you know, to the district uh, collector, ask the circle officer to inquire, nothing ha have ever happens, a report is issued at the behest of the contractors. This of course has had implications on food, on diets, on cultivation, uh, on nutrition. But more importantly, when these people had land and were cultivating, at least occasionally, the patwari or revenue officers or some kind of state uh, representative would visit them to find out what the problems were. There was some kind of interaction that went on. But without land now, they seem to have completely dropped out of the radars of the state and other public uh, agencies. So apart from the material consequences in terms of insecurity, uncertainty, and so on, but there seems to be a very rapid shift in terms of their social identity from cultivators or chasahor, which they really prided themselves on, to laborers. Briefly uh, looking at uh, a migration, the 2017 economic survey shows that 5 million working age population migrate from Jharkhand each year. This is the highest amongst Indian states. West Bengal receives the highest number of migrants, followed by Bihar and UP. Female migration has almost doubled in the last two decades after the formation of Jharkhand compared to the previous decade, 1991 to 2001. This is according to census figures. Yet it appears that migration has not really contributed to improving their lives uh, substantially. These vary, of course, by uh, ethnic group, gender, uh, where they go, for what sort of migration stream, and so on. I think what has happened now is that almost, while migration has been uh, an old phenomenon, almost every Santhal family, a tribal family now, even in the remote forested areas from which there was no migration, now has a migrant worker. The patterns continue to be 
gendered in response to highly segregated labor markets. This has not changed. So the segregation of labor markets has really not uh, changed. So women, you have seasonal uh, migrants uh, going to West Bengal for transplanting and harvesting paddy uh, twice or three times or four times a year and the men actually the number of men going to West Bengal has really come down because they don't want to be seen as performing labor work especially in uh, in and around their family and people from their local area it's seen as demeaning to their identity <coughs> um, young women have been going to Delhi and other cities uh, for, for domestic work, a lot of research on domestic work recently, but I don't have time to go into it. But tribal women in Delhi, for instance, have really been given preference as live-in domestic workers due to the stereotypes of them being honest, obedient, hardworking, but also easier to control than non-tribal counterparts. Scheduled caste women, of course, because of notion, notions of pollution and purity, will not be kept as live-in workers. Uh, the one important sort of agricultural uh, work stream uh, has been of men going to UP, a Western UP, to uh, for ostensibly for sugarcane work. And I would just take a few minutes to look at this example to say what it says about the nature of labor regimes and relations, and also the implications for wide, wider notions of production and reproduction. So here, these men are really living as farm servants. Uh, but they represent themselves as sugarcane workers. The conditions are near bonded. They are working uh, all the time. And that's just a quote from one of the young um, Santhal uh, men. Most of them are illiterate. Um, they depend on village level agents to facilitate this migration. The only reason that they do this is because the work is regular. It stretches over a period of five to nine months from August, September, once they have finished their own planting at home and till about May, so they come home in time for their own next paddy uh, crop, which needs to be planted in June, uh, July. Incomes are predictable, even though low. And despite uh, involving hard manual work, this seems to be a secure option in terms of meeting immediate uh, needs. Uh, the labor contractors are uh, familiar. They go through labor contractors. They're familiar with both the source and the, de uh, and the destination. But the interesting point uh, with the labor contractors is that ethnic identity here again seems to matter, seems to play out. So I would briefly talk about two, uh, two boys, one uh, Santhal, 22, uh, he studied in a mission school up to secondary school, he couldn't get a job, so he went along with a group of other boys from his village to work as a knocker on a monthly salary of rupees uh, 1000 or so in addition to food and accommodation. He was highly frustrated because he in fact said to me that I wish I hadn't studied if I had to do this kind of uh, of work. But this led him to think of other ways in which he could fulfill his aspirations. So while working as a laborer, he developed links with other sugarcane uh, farmers, turned into a labor contractor. He took uh, 17 migrants in 2008. This gave him a savings of uh, 20,000. He opened a bank account, bought a mobile phone. Uh, and these were kind of markers of status at that time. Still, few Santhals had mobile phones, which were a privilege of the educated Hindu Yet the following year, he quit labor contracting. He said that because he was a tribal, the Jat farmers in Western UP found him lacking in communication and negotiation skills necessary for a contractor. In contrast, there was a Muslim boy from the same village, less educated, but he has done much better. So this really points to the complexity of social relationships, including those of authority at home and the destination. The Santhal boy owns land. He's more educated than Ahmed, the Muslim boy. And while his skills, knowledge are recognized at home, he's unable to command the same authority at the destination. So controlling labor here is clearly not enough to gain such authority, not even the, so, uh, the accumulation of capital and symbols of wealth, such as a bank account and mobile phone. Santhals like him strive to create relations of reciprocity and redistribution in their desire for social parity and dignity, yet the chain exchanges at the destination reinforce hierarchies based on ethnicity and language. 
rather than education or even capital. I think he's giving credence once again to Melissa's contention that identity remains crucial terms of domestic and cosmic relations. In fact, this does come out from sort of the development indices, including the gender development index and the gender empowerment uh, measure for Jharkhand, which is slightly better than, say, Bihar, to not uh, equal necessarily. I think part of the point is that men also don't have control in uh, uh, the pu public sphere. And this, in fact, their own marginality intensifies opposition to women's independent claims. Today, uh, and uh, over the 90s and 2000s, there was uh, various Supreme Court judgments and so on which sought to give women rights to land. Today, the debate has actually really moved, as I said at the start, beyond women's land rights and its social acceptability in a context when the whole group is, in, is being threatened of uh, losing control over whatever land uh, was theirs. <coughs> So Adivasi identity is no longer prioritized in the construction of Jharkhand as a modern uh, state, which is seen in several recent moves. For the first time after the formation of Jharkhand, we have the appointment of a non-tribal uh, chief minister. All this while, at least the pretext was kept of the Adivasi identity and having a tribal as a chief minister. The domicile policy, the amendment to the Santhal Parganat Tenancy Act and Chota Nagpur Tenancy Act and others. So gender relations now are being uh, uh, directed towards survival and reproduction of the household itself. With men migrating for large parts of the year, they do return with some money, but the social elements of their contributions to household reproduction are greatly minimized. A normal social life is hard to maintain, and women's care burdens, particularly unpaid, unpaid care burdens, have been stretched. At the destination, men contribute to the reproduction of the employer's household, taking over tasks done by both women and uh, children uh, there. Yeah. I think that's, uh, I, it, uh, I have a few more minutes and I just want to come back to my last point about citizenship, this uh, role of state policies and the spaces uh, for change. The persistence of high levels of hunger and malnutrition in rural areas uh, Jharkhand is placed actually 16 out of 17 Indian states in the Global Hunger Index, despite a lower headcount poverty ratio of 39%. Uh, uh, this increasing vulnerability to, uh, unfortunately, these uh, figures are not disaggregated by ethnicity. But this really points to the increasing vulnerability of the poor, to food uh, insecurity, uh, to chronic uh, lack of food intake, but also other things which uh, Drez and Sen have pointed out in terms of access to education, health care, employment, provision of social security, and so on, as a backup to entitlement failures within society. So the need for social support and a strengthening of entitlements is increasingly being emphasized. I think uh, just picking up uh, from Deepankar Gupta's uh, discussion of citizenship and what it uh, entails, I think central uh, to this discussion of citizenship is how are entitlements constructed? What is the basis for entitlements? Are they determined on the basis of needs, so means tested, or returns to work, or in fact universal citizenship uh, entitlements? Uh, Needs-based entitlements could be seen as redistrib redistributive, However, they do stigmatize uh, the needy. And I think, again, on the, in the morning of the first day, Jan Bremen made the point about the undeserving poor. There's increasingly a discourse, including in the Santhal Parganas, of, uh, by the bureaucrats, particularly upper caste Hindu bureaucrats, that Santhal men are lazy, they're drunk, they don't work hard. That's why they continue to live in such uh, poverty. So structural ideological issues are completely kind of forgotten from this uh, discourse. The second basis, of course, is in terms of work-related uh, entitlements. These are more exclusionary and often linked to uh, public employment, so therefore limited in scope. I think there has been an increasing movement of, uh, in terms of recognizing informal employment, the Social Security Unorganized Sector, um, Social Security Act, um, and so on, that recognize that a range of informal sector work situations need to be linked to social insurance programs. Uh, John mentioned the National Food Security Act uh, yesterday, and apart from the food element of it, it also has a clause on maternity benefits uh, as a kind of universal or as uh, to be re recognized as uh, central to, uh, to food security. 
the uh, Prime Minister, uh, he made a statement at the end of, uh, when he made a speech at the end of December uh, 2016, he, uh, he said that, uh, you know, maternity benefits are now going to be provided to all women for up to two children. However, when the budget came, actually the provisions are completely inadequate. So there was a kind of discourse or a promise in terms of implementing some of these sort of gender equal or, uh, agendas moving towards food security and gender equality, but turned out to be quite hollow. The third uh, form of entitlement citizenship deals with public services such as the provision of basic education and basic health care. And of course the proper functioning of these, uh, yeah, just the last paragraph, uh, is key to equality both of uh, gender and uh, ethnicity. And I think we need much more studies, just as Sukhdev Thorat and others have been talking about discrimination against Dalits and have evidence on this. I think we need more studies to look at how are the scheduled tribe groups actually performing in terms of access uh, to education, health, and jobs. So that's really my uh, concluding um, point, I think, which, re which repeats some of the things that we've been hearing over the last two to three days in this conference, that political contestation seems critical for securing uh, both one's material needs or the redistribution of resources and social identities or the need for recognition. This is a struggle over cultural meanings, over modes of sub subjectification, positioning people as specific sorts of people with specific capacities and needs, and over the power to construct what Nancy Fraser calls both authoritative definitions of social situations and also legitimate interpretations of social needs. So we need a new vocabulary for articulating uh, the basis and quality of uh, entitlements. Oppositional movements in Jharkhand need to have now a much clearer articulation of this alternate a vocabulary if they have to resist the current development tra trajectory. And this needs to be based to some extent on the sustainable use of land and natural resources, ensuring social security and livelihoods, but also addressing in some way the rapid rise of social inequalities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Rao. Um, I'd like to just take the chair's prerogative to break the rules, if you don't mind, Shaibalda and other organizers, just to say a few words about this presentation before we open up the session uh, to questions and answers. I'll be very brief. In case you think that this is a Jharkhand issue, uh, I'd really like to draw out the significance of, uh, the national significance of the issues that Nitya Rao, Professor Rao, has just addressed. Indian economic growth is built on the sweat and toil of migrant labor from Eastern India, in particular from Jharkhand, but of course also from Bihar, Andhra Pradesh, Orissa, West Bengal, Maharashtra. Uh, it is, uh, it, in, in all the kind of sites that we've been studying over the last uh, three years uh, in a project I'll tell you about the day after tomorrow, uh, this is the most exploited labor force across the country. It's brought in to cut the labor power of even the local Dalits in places like the Kerala tea plantations or the Kudalo chemical industrial belt. Uh, it is super exploited, a super exploited uh, labor force and, and I think Nitya is right to bring out the significance of Claude Mercer in thinking about uh, about what is going on in contemporary India today. And what is particularly worrying is the changes that are taking place in the Choranagpur Tenancy Acts and the Tantal Parganas Acts, which mean that even what little land people had back at home in Jharkhand, which enabled them you know, to, live, to, to live off that land and not have to uh, migrate or to, to, to be able to, to have alternatives to their livelihoods, is now being snatched away from them as we speak. So um, what's really important about what, what, what uh, Professor Rao has just said is that land rights and labor rights are perhaps the most important issues facing not only the shared futures of Bihar and Jharkhand, but also that of the Indian nation. And I would say that it is anti-national of us not to give that su sufficient space in this conference. So I am extremely grateful to Professor Rao for having put that on our, on our agenda today. So, yeah, uh, I'll open up the floor for questions. Jan? May I follow up to what you have just uh, said, Alpa? 
and which is very important and with uh, much appreciation for what Professor Rao has uh, presented, uh, she has asked for more studies. Uh, I would ask for more contestation uh, from the university, from academia. And here I remind you that only a few days ago, Vice President Ansari has uh, drawn our attention to the need of keeping universities open for as a free space, as a free space of discussion, of deliberation, but also of reporting what's going on in the country and what is increasingly being labeled as anti-national when you report, when you monitor this kind of situation and report your findings. There is an urgent need, and it has already been said yesterday, uh, a kind of uh, claim that the intelligentsia of this country remains alert. I'm so happy that Adri convened this, convened this meeting to address major questions in the country. The questions just raised in the presentation of Professor Rao, land and labor are of the utmost urgency. But to keep the debate open, to keep at least this part of open society accessible to researchers and reporters is very important. Thank you. Thank you, Nithya, for a wonderful paper which sort of matched up to, you know, what I was thinking was happening right now. Um, it seems to me that the Jharkhand dream, which has come to a final end in 2016, and, and we can now bury it, and that is a very sad um, thing for me, who's been a historian of the Jharkhand movement. But one thing I want to draw your attention to is, this, in terms of education, is the disturbing new trend which is being studied by this young scholar called Malavika Gupta about um, RSS boarding schools. So the, the fact that there, are, there is this now this perception that, uh, 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 that uh, they are not being educated is now leading to whole scale, in Orissa in particular, and I, I know also in Jharkhand, to children being taken out of their home environment and put in these uh, boarding schools, rather like uh, it, it used to happen uh, in, in, in the Nazi movement. And it's just completely horrifying. And I think we have to be aware of this, and there should be more research on this, but I draw your attention to the work of Malavika Gupta on this, yeah. Madam, I have a question. You have talked about the SPT Act. Other you have criticized it. Land in Jharkhand and in Santhal Pragana it is still being transferred on the name of Danpat. It is a common feature. And the land owners are getting one fourth of the market price. You, you, you have visited Dumka, you must have seen that there is no good school or hospital. Railway has come just three years back. So we need land for the development of that area. In this case, if there is no change in the SPT Act, how do you see, how could the development take place in this backward region? People are still migrating, having land, a large quantity of land, and they are going to Delhi and Haryana and Punjab for migrant laborers. So my question is that why not change the SPT Act and accommodate them to their own places by giving them jobs and other things. And the, the recent rules in Jharkhand, that is Land Acquisition, Fair Compensation and Rehabilitation and uh, Resettlement Act, provides for a Gram Sabha, only, only after the uh, uh, consent of Gram Sabha, land can be uh, taken from the farmers. Thank you for 
for this impressive presentation. Uh, I am wondering about, uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, unionization has been restrained, and of course employment has become much more casual, but uh, without speaking of migration, forced migration. But I am wondering, visiting uh, again Jarkon, what about uh, unskillment scheme? Some people uh, are, are talk, telling me about some new unskillment scheme, but I don't know exactly if there is any uh, outcome. Uh, out and my second point is about citizenship and uh, I, I wonder really uh, what is the score for an Adivasi agenda in Indian citizenship today. I, I am uh, really fearing a situation like uh, it happened in Australia, you know, or within a, uh, in the future you will have some pocket of Adivasi left and, and, and that's all with uh, identity denied. So I just think also of uh, uh, Sanjeev Barwa, uh, who mentioned uh, the concept of denizen, uh, rather than citizen, when uh, applied to Adivasis. I think for me it's a long way for Adivasi becoming citizens. I really don't see how. Thank you very much for your presentation, but it was very thorough and very interesting. I spent a few days in 2011 in Jharkhand with a land rights organization called Ekta Parishad, and we were meeting with different groups in struggle. And I would have to say that most of the groups we met were led by women. Their voices were loud and clear, um, and it came down to issues just like homestead rights, rather than even talking about more than just having a house or having a piece of land to build a house on. It was as, as, as desperate as that. Um, but the people we met, particularly in the mining areas, um, showed huge resilience. But when you looked at the countryside around them, and you were almost drawn to tears because of the conditions that their lives had been left in. I have one question um, because of other work that I've been involved in in, in that area uh, into uh, whether over the years that you've been studying um, the villages that you've been involved in, whether you've seen any changes in uh, the age at which women get married and also um, about the uh, children, uh, how many children are they having over what sort of period because these obviously have very important reflections on whether uh, women's position in that region is changing. for those questions. Uh, uh, Jan, I think I uh, totally agree uh, with you that uh, it's not just about more studies and more research, but also having more of a debate, more visibility. Uh, like Dalit studies is very well organized. I think uh, tribal studies probably is not that well uh, organized in terms of uh, having those spaces uh, uh, for deliberation and contestation. But I think I totally agree with you that the debate uh, has to be kept open. Uh, Vinita, thanks for the point on the RSS boarding schools. I hadn't realized that. I had a picture of the temples which were being built all across uh, Jharkhand over the last 10 or 15 years, the Hanuman temples, but I hadn't realized uh, that the RSS boarding schools. I'm not very surprised because a couple of years ago, actually they were really harassing the mission schools and taking away their uh, licenses, particularly, or taking away their registrations, particularly uh, some of the mission schools in terms of the grade 10, giving the board exams. So you had to go to the other schools, the public schools. So I'm not surprised that one step from there is going to the RSS uh, boarding schools. The SPTA and the Dan Patra, yes, uh, especially for urban development in Dumka, I think after 2000, when uh, Dumka uh, became the up, uh, Upraj Dhani of uh, Jharkhand, there was a lot of demand, as you say, for offices, for uh, government offices, for railway station, for various other things, for government officers, and a lot of the land was being transferred uh, through Dan Patra, which was um, a bit uh, exploitative because very low rates uh, were being uh, received for that. I think there was a demand and there was also negotiation that not necessarily trans, uh, to amend the Santhal Pargana Tenancy Act, but to negotiate some kind of distance 
uh, around the city for sort of urban development and so on, which had been put forward at that time. I think the risk in terms of indiscriminate uh, amendment that then on this on the pretext of some form of urban or some development project i mean everything is a development project so the people said even for the railway line that we are not averse to giving land for the railway line but they have taken much more than they actually need so they have taken um, you know about 500 meters on either side of the railway line acquired there is that much land was not really required for the railway line so i think a lot of extra land got taken over from the people and i think this was the problem in terms of uh, having some control or some restrictions to continue with uh, with the act um Homestead rights uh, and Ekta Parishad, yes, I've been involved actually with Ekta Parishad also for as long. And uh, now they are celebrating homestead rights. And I've had a lot of discussions with Ramesh and many other people within Ekta Parishad. It's been highly frustrating. Uh, exercise. I think women, uh, are, I'm not surprised, are at the forefront because actually the men are all now more or less migrant uh, workers. And there has been a feminization of the rural and feminization of agriculture, including in uh, Jharkhand. And therefore, they are the people there. They're just trying to protect whatever they can for the reproduction of the domestic economy. Because if they lose that, if they even lose that space, then they are going to become some kind of slum you know, move to slum uh, dwellers. Age uh, at marriage and number of children, I haven't looked at the data, but actually age at marriage was always high. It was not very low. Amongst the Santhals, even 20 years ago, they were not getting married early. They were still getting married 16, 17, 18. There might be some exceptions, but it was not, um, the high fertility rate was more to do with very poor health care provision. So I'm presuming that if healthcare provision improves, then fertility is probably uh, going to go down. Maybe I'll stop with that. Thank you. Thank you so much for your questions and big round of applause for Professor Rao. Thank you, Professor Nitya and Professor Alpa. We will now break for tea and be back at 6 o'clock sharp.